Uh, oh, actually, let me start uh, uh, just uh, with a, um, uh, a bit of, uh, uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, Joe uh, gave uh, presentations, uh, two presentations to uh, our meeting uh, about two major initiatives uh, of the Academy. Uh, and uh, what I thought, now they're both in, and enough time to actually collect data uh, and understand, did it work? Uh, and I think there are uh, really interesting uh, uh, things. Uh, one is about reframing the print journal. Uh, the other is about creating a, a member portal. These are things that I've heard many of you talk about uh, over the years. Uh, and so I really wanted to see uh, what, what's working. It's working. OK. Yeah. All right. We'll take a break. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> uh, good morning, everybody. I'm glad to open up today's uh, sessions and be the first presenter. Um, as John said, um, you may remember my presentations from the past, talking about the pre-launch of um, AAP Gateway and our uh, new print edition for pediatrics. Um, so this morning, I want to share with you some stats and um, member interviews that we conducted and to really show you the outcomes and how we measure the effectiveness of uh, these two products. Um, I will say that um, these two projects were not easy to deploy, very challenging for staff, and also alarming for our members. We essentially launched these two products within 60 days of one another, and it was just too much for our members to actually absorb. So just to kind of recap here, so those who are not familiar with Gateway, uh, we launched on no November 1st of 2015, uh, gateway.aap.org, and this is our clinical research and news network. Uh, we took all of our journals and combined them under one umbrella so that our members, our customers, can see all content across all five journal products. Um, in addition, we deliver up-to-the-minute up to information to our members daily, and as well as deliver relevant content to our members based on their interests and or specialties. And that information that we're pulling to deliver the relevant content is tied back to the NetForum, um, our NetForum database, which reads the member's profile. You have to be a member in order to receive the relevant content um, on the network. Um, so, um, um, so, so we deployed it and um, it's been working well. We did two years of research and focus groups um, before actually going to deployment. We wanted to make sure that we understood our customers' behaviors and how they were interacting with the journals and reading our content. Um, however, I will say that um, I actually delayed the project's launch by one year um, to refocus and focus on the vision and the objectives. The project started to grow and get out of control. Too many um, members or staff at the academy were trying to be part of the project, and I lost control of it. So I pulled back and said, I'm, I'm, I'm stopping the project, and I'll launch it one year later. And I'm, and I'm glad I did, because the numbers grew on us. We grew 20% over one year. We saw 1.5 million unique new users to the, uh, to the network. And four months into, um, um, into the live environment, we were looking at the data and kind of wondering what's going on here. Why are we growing so rapidly? Well, we only saw like a 2 or 3% modest growth across some previous years. So I told my staff, let's not get too excited here and, and talk about success stories until we know that these numbers are true. Um, sure enough, a year later, we, they were true. Um, we're now reaching 1.1 to 1.3 million, um, million users per month, and we're speculating that we'll reach about 14 million unique visitors at the end of this year. Um, however, we don't know who these users are. So we're planning to work with a firm um, out of Chicago to help us um, capitalize on these users to really understand who they are. Are they nurses? Are they just the pediatricians, researchers, physician assistants? So we need to know this data in order to deliver more relevant content campaigns to, to these uh, new members coming to the site. So um, there were eight strategic drivers um, which were driving content to the members. Um, the first one is AAP News. This is our news, uh, our, our, our uh, Academy member benefit news magazine. Um, AAP News saw an 18% growth in readership year over year. Um, they actually are using direct publishing, and we report daily, Monday through Friday, to our members. We release about four to six news articles um, each day, talking about trends in the industry. Uh, but AAP News is the first source into summarizing the content in Pediatrics the Journal. Um, our members don't read the research. Um, it's too dense. So they, they turn to AAP News to have them summarize what they're actually reading in the journal. So the second driver is the journal's blog, and uh, we saw a 300% growth rate over one year. 
And what we're doing here is we have our editors, our executive editors, section editors, and general editorial board members um, actually blogging daily, talking about the research, summarizing the research for our clinicians, telling them why you need to know the subject matter, what's important here, how to implement it in your practice. So it's been working. Uh, we did have a, uh, a hard time um, convincing editors and the board members to participate in the blogs, but um, they said, we don't know how to blog, show us. So we, we did a little training, we coached them, and now they, they enjoy blogging with us um, on a daily basis. Uh, third driver, social media. Uh, we saw hefty increases in our social media campaigns. Facebook uh, increased by 111%, Twitter by 45%. And um, right now, Pediatrics launched on Instagram last fall, and the editor of Pediatrics is really enjoying the Instagram account because he, he, he posts a video every Monday. It's a one-minute video talking about the research that's coming out during that week. Um, and we realized that a lot of visual imagery and um, is very important. Pictures is what's drawing in a lot of our users to our social media campaigns. So we have someone on staff strictly focusing on social media. Um, the fourth driver, um, last June, we launched on TrendMD, and we had seen some su successes there. Uh, we saw um, over, uh, since June, 12 million viewable links um, showcased on, on within our own network, within our own journals. And we're working with TrendMD on, on the enterprise plan where we're boosting certain content on the external network as well. Uh, the fifth driver is daily research. We used to just publish on Mondays only, um, but we're now we're publishing Monday through Friday, so we have more media coverage um, and more exposure to our content. So that's driving a lot of users back uh, to the network itself. Uh, pollination, this was uh, one of the major objectives uh, when planning um, this network was that we wanted to make sure that we were cross-promoting um, all content in all journals. We wanted our members to be exposed to the content. A lot of them didn't recognize all the products that we had. So, and as well as the improved search now that we have on the network, there's a lot more discoverability. Uh, so we're doing uh, very well on the exposure end. Uh, the seventh driver is our insights custom alert. Um, this is handled um, in-house. It's not on the Highwire platform. Uh, we use um, our Pardot system, which, which is an email marketing um, program in which we send out custom alerts. So we look at Impact Pfizer, Usage Pfizer, analytics to see uh, which, uh, which articles are getting the most play within the month and cited and coverage from the media, and we are re-promoting this content back out to our members. So we launched this back in, um, in February, and we now have a 25% open rate on the, on the campaign. We hope to see this grow over the next 12 months. And then finally, Pediatrics Print Edition is causing, I think, uh, higher usage to the network. Um, in last January, we um, deployed our new print edition, which is the abstracts only edition. We pulled out all the full text content and only left the AAP, AAP policy statement full text content in the journal. So we're forcing our members now to go online, but also encourage them to read print again. So um, we wanted to find out the pain points from our customers. You know, were we successful? Do we meet the objectives? So um, six months into the live environment, we went back out and we interviewed 18 uh, clinicians. We did it across various age groups. Um, we, we had private practice cl clinicians and hospital-based clinicians participate in this um, observational study. We gave them all exercise scenarios. Um, we wanted to see how they were interacting with, with the platform. Um, what was the overall impression? They really liked the site. They said it was clean. Um, easy to navigate, um, and they were very encouraged to see that we were providing um, daily information um, on the platform. And then what was more important was the search criteria. Uh, we wanted to make sure that um, members were finding our content and they weren't finding any hiccups in, in discoverability. So, um, so we watched them and we gave them specific exercises to search on certain, certain terms um, to see how they were actually um, finding the content. And I have to say, there was one physician that went to Google, did a search on a statement, a policy statement, found it immediately, came up number one in Google, got into our platform, then we asked her to navigate to Pediatrics Journal, and she went back out to Google to come back in. So that was a little alarming. Um, but what was most concerning was that um, we had a lot of staff complaints versus member complaints. Um, internal staff outside of the Department of Publishing had a hard time navigating the platform and using search and the advanced search page. And um, we, we couldn't understand why. I think it was just a massive change for staff. Uh, I, I think in years past, the sites were built uh, for staff versus members, and, and now it's a member platform. And so it took us about four months to retrain our managers into the sections and councils and committees. 
And then, of course, um, there was confusion with AAP.org, which is the Academy's flagship web website. Um, a lot of the, again, we knew this in the pre-research. Um, many of our members thought that Gateway was the new AAP.org site. So there's a blurred vision there. And the Academy is right now in, in a dig digital transformation um, process of redefining its website and looking at how we bring all properties together. So there were five patterns that we discovered um, during these interviews. The first one was the local descriptor. We, um, the platform was called AAP Gateway. Um, that wasn't very clear to our members. Um, so if you were coming in from Google, they recognized that something was different, but they didn't know where they were. So we since changed that descriptor to read AAP News and Journals Gateway. It's more descriptive now. Now you know you're reading news and journal content on the platform. Um, AAP News Branding was also kind of confusing to our members. On the interface of gateway.aap.org, uh, we just said news. When you clicked on a news item or story, um, you saw the, the AP News logo branding on the article itself, so there was a disconnect there. So we since put AP News branded logo on the interface of Gateway to make it more clear that this content is coming from AP News. Um, the orange menu box, if you've been to the site, um, there's an orange menu box, um, a hamburger menu on the left-hand side. Um, and that's where all of our journals live, the links. Our members did not know what that box was, and when we asked them to um, tell us how would you get to the journal Pediatrics or Pediatrics in Review, they didn't know where to go. No one opened that box. Um, at the bottom of the page, we had what we call product recommendations that showed images of all the products we have. They were using that as the navigational element. So they were looking at the top header for the navigation for the links and at the bottom. So we haven't fixed the orange menu yet. We're working with Highwire on the, on the navigation and uh, seeing how we can better improve that. Um, search results, I think we missed the benchmark here. Um, in pre-research, uh, in our prototypes and in the focus groups, we um, asked our members, you know, um, we're going to allow you to search all, all content across all journals. Um, are you okay with receiving all the content in your search results? And they said, yes, let us filter out the content as needed. So we built the search that way. We went back to um, the testing, and there was a little confusion. Members were, um, were not using the filters. And they were kind of confused and trying to understand why they were getting news content with journal content. So we changed the search. And now, as a member, you go in, you do your search. You can search all journals or select a product to search. Um, that made it a lot more easier for the members now. And then um, education. Despite the two years of marketing materials we put out, commentaries I wrote in pediatrics, um, a user guide we put in with a poly bag of pediatrics, they and our booth at our annual meeting for two years in a row, no one knew about the site. Uh, <laughs> so it was very confusing and disconcerting. So we should have done, uh, no matter how much educating or marketing you do, it still isn't enough. And that's why we learned people weren't reading pediatrics. They weren't reading the content we were publishing in pediatrics talking about Gateway. So that's OK. Um, we saw a 57% growth in mobile. Um, tablet is dropping. and. Um, um, I think this is due to the responsive um, design of the site. Um, and also what's, what's really interesting is before launch, uh, mobile was only used like between 7 and 8 a.m. And then you, clinicians would pick up the mobile device and use it between you know, 5 and 8 p.m. But now we're seeing them using mobile devices throughout the day, so which tells us that either they're, they're looking at the content on, from the journal on their phone, reading it between seeing patients or doing the rounds at the hospital, or looking for content at bedside, which is what we're focusing on more as we move forward. So looking back, uh, we should have paralleled the current site with the new site for at least three months. Um, just to um, give our members um, a flavor of what was coming in, in, in three months, you know, have them play with the site or at least a prototype um, and, and, and be comfortable with it. We just flipped the switch and went to the new site and that was very alarming to a lot of individuals. Um, there was one physician who was very angry, called our customer service center, and um, he was looking, he was meeting with a patient, he was looking for a specific subject matter in pediatrics and review, went to the site and he couldn't find it or he didn't know where to start, he didn't know how to use the search, and was very upset. So of course I had the privilege of calling that physician and talking with him. When I called two days later, he said, everything's fine, I love the site. I was just alarmed that I didn't know that the site was coming. So again, um, we announced it, but um, no one paid attention. Um, allow adequate time for testing. Uh, unfortunately, we tied our launch to our annual meeting, 
and we had all the marketing materials prepared. We had our booth at the annual meeting. We did presentations to the boards, and um, we were tied into the to the launch date. Uh, we essentially had about two or three weeks to launch, and, and Maya, you know, it was great working with, and she helped us through it. But um, never again will I tie a, a massive project to a targeted date or meeting. Big mistake. Um, we should have done webinars prior to the launch. Again, getting our users comfortable with the site, and then after. Um, launch, we should have done webinars. We haven't done any of that yet. Um, and again, focus on goals. Um, as I said earlier, we got too many people from the academy involved in this project and it got out of control. Um, so I pulled it back and, and, and delayed the launch. And then of course the user experience is never completed. Uh, we're con we continue to make changes. If a customer or a member complains, we note it, but we're not gonna react to it. We'll let it age over time to see if it, if, if in fact, if it's a deal or not a deal. So, 60 days later, we launched Pediatrics Print Edition. Um, and I believe um, John, he had some um, copies that he was gonna pass out. Excuse me. <clears throat> so, um, 60 days later, we um, introduced Pediatrics Print Edition. And the timing was off because I delayed the launch of Gateway. Gateway was supposed to launch one year prior and then the new print edition was supposed to come out a year later. Um, it didn't work out that way. Um, the reason we went to the abstracts only edition is because uh, clinicians are very busy. The pediatricians are very busy. They don't read the research. They want us to summarize the content for them um, and tell them why you, you just need to know this, this information. Um, we were originally publishing 250 pages monthly or so. Uh, we published um, uh, on launch 80 pages. So we reduced our cost by about $200,000. So a very significant savings on the, on the print side. So the past membership had told us that members were just scanning the table of contents and circling the articles of interest and then going online and downloading the PDF. They would just skim it. And we knew that there was about 15% of our customers actually reading print. So again, the whole idea of going to the abstract edition was to get our readers to engage with print once again, but also use the online content as well. So we wanted to make sure that, you know, do we do this right? Are, are our members happy about the new edition? And they are. We got a lot of positive feedback. So we did a little, um, we did a readership survey last September right before the uh, editorial board meeting for pediatrics. And so we repeated one of the questions was, what percent of the time do you read the journal? And, and so in 2016, we're seeing more growth on the um, print side. It increased, our members are reading at 25 to 50 percent more of the time. Um, online, obviously, um, leveled out, but it's also increasing because members are going online reading the print. So online on the 25% side in 2015 dropped, but it picked up and leveled off in um, 2016. And then, of course, mobile obviously increased um, um, in 2016. So after we launched, um, the editor calls me and said, we need to shift. I said, you're killing me, Lois. <laughs> what are you talking about? He says, well, um, section editors of the executive board um, are complaining that their content or their sections are not included in print. I said, well, were they not paying attention to the board meetings? Because we showed them the prototypes two years in a row. We talked about it. We said only the original research uh, will include abstracts in print and full text of policy statements in the journal. So we went back and forth. He says, you know, we got to please the, the, the executive board. I said, okay, I'll, I'll agree to that. So we added the feature sections back in three months later, and then we put the commentaries back in. So we're including commentaries ahead of the research, and that actually has gained a lot of popularity with our customers because the commentaries are sort of like summarizing the research and giving very opinionated commentary. So that worked. But um, by doing this, our, our page number went up a little bit. So now we're averaging about 100, 110 pages per month. Um, we recently launched our Twitter-like summaries to our table of contents. Again, we want our members to dig deeper into the print issue. Uh, we want to give them a preview of what the articles are all about. So we, use, we now have authors writing the uh, Twitter-like summaries uh, upon submission, and they're peer-reviewed. Uh, we also use these, these Twitter-like summaries for um, our social media campaign so that uh, we don't have to rewrite the content. Um, we, is, so we just launched it, so I don't have any benchmark data to see if this has been uh, popular or successful, but we'll watch it over time. Uh, feedback on the print edition. So we have a circulation of 70,000, and um, I received less than 30 complaints on, on the print. I was very nervous um, at launch because we knew 15% of the of our customers are going to want to read the print issue. and and. 
going back to the, to the pre-research, a lot of our customers didn't realize we were only printing 50% of the content in the journal, and the other 50% were online. So we had yeah, about eight really difficult calls that came through customer service, and unfortunately, I had to handle them. And so I, I handled the calls, and I explained um, to, the, to the callers uh, why we did this, explained the research, and then at the end of the call, they all agreed and said, you know what, I actually read the journal, the way you, your research is just stating what you're, what you're finding. So everything was fine. We haven't received any more complaints. The editor continues to receive uh, compliments on the format of the journal from other hospitals and organizations. So, so it's all is good, and we'll keep improving the, the addition of prints. We're now putting video abstracts into um, uh, the journal effective uh, next year, and I can report on that later. So did I? So comments. Um, we were accused of going on Weight Watchers um, when we launched, and um, two -third, we lost two-thirds of our body weight. And then, of course, we were also accused that uh, we were putting manufacturers of bookcases out of business. Um, so, you know, whatever. <laughs> Um, but the second comment on the, on the right came from a very vocal member of the academy. And this individual would always just complain about something um, we launched or a product or whatever it is. And would go on the listserv and just get everybody all riled up and start complaining about this. And I thought it was kind of odd that we didn't hear from him at launch until a year later. And he said, you know, he's happy to say that he really likes the new format now. Um, he likes the commentary ahead of the articles. It makes sense. He doesn't miss the long dissertations, and it's easier to take the journal while traveling. So that's, I take that as a huge compliment um, to our success. So looking back, um, if you think you're over-communicating, keep communicating. Um, because <laughs> we, you know, we, we had um, a flyer in the poly bag, uh, that, that's the flyer there, um, that uh, mailed with the Pediatrics Journal for three months consecutively. Um, apparently nobody opened the poly bag. Um, we wrote commentaries and um, well, we, we, we talked about it. We did a lot of marketing campaigns, direct mail pieces. So um, what we should have done was parallel the new format with the current edition. Maybe we should have taken a sample of the new edition and put it in a poly bag and send it out to a segment of the population. We should have done that, but you live and learn. Um, I should have trained staff more customer service on, hand, on how to handle inquiries. So I knew all the research in my head. I knew um, the results, but uh, customer service didn't know that, and I should have met with them to coach them on how to handle any calls that came through the customer service center. And, um, and don't throw a lot of change out at your customers. As I said, we did this all in 60 days, Launch Gateway, and then the new print edition, and it was just kind of alarming for our members to absorb all this new change. And so finally, um, advertising was really um, a crucial factor in our print edition because uh, the Kantar Media reports that measure our position in ad exposures. Um, so as a journal, we were too dense and we fell in, in seventh place compared to a tabloid edition that prints maybe 32 or 36 pages and they would get more of the advertising. By going to a thinner issue, um, we're hoping to improve our ranking and grab more advertising, display advertising to the print journal. Um, the advertisers um, now, they like the thinner issue. Uh, they prefer the abstracts, but somebody's been counting our pages. Um, according to our ad agency, uh, the reps are actually, um, they noticed that we increased the page count from 80 to over 100, and they were asking why we were doing that. So again, I had to put the, put the journal back on its diet and reduce that page count a little bit. On the box ad, uh, 300 by 250 runs on Gateway. It's a locked ad position. Um, advertisers like that because we're in compliance with the viewability standards, so that ad is always appearing on the site um, and increases the exposure. And then, of course, we're working on um, uh, developing targeted advertising and list matching to do more targeted advertising to our, to our customers. And we're currently working with one of the largest uh, media buying agencies on having them. Uh, we turned over our list to them and they're doing list matching against their list to do targeted advertising back on Gateway. So um, we're very proud of um, the two product launches. They were successful. And as I said, we did have challenges, but um, at the end of the day, uh, we were very happy with the results. Uh, thank you. I think it's amazing. Um, questions for Joe? I, Joe, one thing I, I just wanted to reinforce, if I remember from your earlier presentation, uh, in your meetings with uh, people before you implemented the new print edition, advertisers preferred it. 
They, they actually they wanted this to happen. That yes. is, it, so it was sort of, to me, I don't you know, really know a lot about print advertising. It seemed mm -hmm. counterintuitive, and, and that yeah. stayed. They, they like it. They do, and, and they, for many years, they questioned the thickness of the journal. And also, um, we include page numbers on the, on the cover TLC. Oh, and um, right. I took the, the page numbers off the TLC um, a couple years ago, and the board fought me on that. But the advertisers wanted those numbers off so that you force the reader to, to go into the journal, and then you'll see their <laughs> ads. So I lost that battle. But yes, they prefer that very thin issue. Cool. Um, so uh, did you, I guess it's hard to get numbers for this, but I was kind of interested in on your um, or, or your kind of like cycle of all the things you did, you talked about going to daily content release. Now it's that seems that kind of seems to tie in with the notion when people talk about blogs, they say you know you have to blog with a certain frequency, otherwise people yeah. just stop looking. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, there's the kind of the other end of the scale. You've got this notion that people are bombarded with information, and if they get a lot of it, they just pick the little mm -hmm. bits that they want to rather than. Um, getting any kind of serendipity like a whole journal mm -hmm. issue release will make people potentially read things they wouldn't otherwise. So I wondered if you had any thoughts of A, the impact of the daily release and whether that was changing people's behavior and the pros and cons of it. So you know, I don't have any data on that and, and that's something that we're going to study because I don't know if, um, so it's hard to tell if what our readers are actually reading daily and uh, my assumption is they're, they're going to AP News to read uh, the content that we're publishing daily. Um, if these are the clinicians, they're not going to read that dense research. Um, on the blog side, I, you know, we, you know, we need to do more profile audience identity to understand who's reading what. And I think, um, I think, with showing the 300% increase on the blog side, the, our readers are using that more than on the journal side daily. So it's something that we're going to have to watch and measure. Hi, great Hi. presentation. Could you say a little bit about the Insights Monthly thing? Mm -hmm. um, you said you used the Impact Visor to mm -hmm. see what the hot articles were. Is the email alert generated automatically by interest, or is it something that's crafted by hand by a person? And it's, anything it's, else? Yeah, it's done manually um, on my team. Mm -hmm. So um, we'll sit down once a month and we'll look at all the data, and then we'll look at what was covered in the media, and they determine the hot articles. And then uh, we, we just um, put everything into a template, and it goes out through our Pardot um, system, and then um, we hope to do it actually uh, weekly eventually. And you said you have a 25% open rate? Yes. Does the subject line include a topical information or does it say something with your, your brand on it? How does that um, work? I, I think it says um, th um, think, uh, what you need to know in pediatrics. We were trying to be clever with the subject line, not pointing out any one particular article. Mm -hmm. So we're playing around with the subject lines to see what gets more exposure. But um, uh, we were impressed that it was successful on the first launch. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Thank you. Question in the back. I have a question about the, the Twitter feed. How do you feed the Twitter feed with the summaries? Is that an automatic process? Uh, no, it's, it's not. So the editor um, will tweet um, himself daily, but then um, I have someone on my team writing the tweets for him, and then he'll review them, and then we'll post them um, on his behalf. So those are summaries that are newly made? I'm sorry? Those are, the summaries are newly yes. written? Yes, okay. exactly, yes. Okay. And are they, they're not every article, they no. are, they are selected. They're selected articles um, based on what the editor thinks is important or what the, um, you know, what the media may be interested in as well. All right. Uh, one thing I'd sometime like to follow up on is how you got editors to blog. <laughs> uh, but we'll do that in the fall maybe. Yeah, that other, sounds really another discussion. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, over drinks then. Uh, thank you very okay. much, Joe. Thank you. Appreciate it.